Hi, this is Shauna, the CEO and founder of Fuel Talent. One of the things I have loved most in my 25-year recruiting career has always been the stories that people tell. Stories of leadership, career choices, company ideas, and team building. My inspiration for starting the What Fuels You podcast came from being curious about people's lives and wanting to help share their stories. What path brought them to this place? What decisions did they make that led to failures and successes? Who influenced those decisions and what lessons were learned along the way? I hope you enjoy the What Fuels You podcast. Today on the What Fuels You podcast, I have Matt Oppenheimer here with me. Matt is the co-founder and CEO of Remitly, the largest private digital remittance company in the U.S. He was inspired to get into this space after seeing all of the hurdles consumers face while he was working in the U.K. and Kenya. Since it was founded in 2011, Remitly has raised over $200 million and continues to expand to more countries at an incredible pace. Matt is a husband, father, and incredible community leader. I'm so excited to hear more of his story and share it with you. Welcome, Thanks. Matt. Thanks, Shauna. Great to be here. Let's start with Rapid Fire. I'm throwing you off here. Favorite podcast? Oh, I love the Serial podcast. I got oh. really, really hooked to Serial. Which was, Are you done with it? I am done with it, yeah. That's a lot of hours. <laughs> it was. I could not put it down. It was amazing. I need to know when you have time to do all that. Um, favorite country outside the U.S.? Mm, so many options on that one, but the rapid fire answer would probably be Kenya since I live there and have so many fond memories of being there. I want to hear about that. That's incredible that you live there. Um, this is going to be a tough one. Dartmouth or Harvard? Oh, there is a, uh, uh, there's a deep, deep just connection I have with Dartmouth. Yeah. Um, and it's just a, such a wonderful community. So yeah. Dartmouth. Dartmouth. Um, extrovert or introvert? Extrovert. I love that. Um, favorite ice cream flavor? Uh, well, I like all Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Um, and I'm going to have to go with probably half-baked. Oh, so good. Yeah. I love Ben and Jerry's also. Oh, it's delicious. I want to be Ben or Jerry. We had it at our wedding as the dessert. Oh, you did? Yeah, That's it, so yeah. random. Yeah, I just said ice cream because I had a gut feeling you were an ice cream guy. <laughs> yeah. I don't know These why. are easy. This is fun. <laughs> mountains or water? Uh, I love both, but probably mountains. Mountains. Yeah. Nice. Are you a skier or a snowboarder? I am a skier, but I'm more into Nordic skiing actually recently. Which is I that the like. is that like cross country? Cross skiing? country, yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be good for you. I love it. I'm well, so and I know that you're you've competed in yeah, triathlons I mean, type things. I'm, I'm a big runner, and so big I've done runner. a bunch of marathons. I love running. Yeah, and yeah. Nordic skiing is like similar to that. That's thing. awesome. Okay, so um, in getting ready for this podcast, I did a little research, and you're kind yes. of famous in Idaho. And <laughs> I didn't realize you were fifth generation yes. Idahoan. What was your childhood like in Idaho? Like. Uh, I grew up in Boise, which okay. is uh, and really close to downtown Boise, so uh, probably half a mile from there. And I love Idaho. I mean, all my family's there. Um, it's a just really strong community. I have a group of seven uh, friends from high school that I stay in very, very close touch with. That That's are just so cool. Truly, like fa extended family for me, and yeah. they're diverse in terms of what they do. One is a journeyman, so he lays power lines. One's a police officer. Um, one is a uh, physician's assistant. Um, they're just phenomenal, like phenomenal, phenomenal humans. Are they all still in Idaho? One went to San Francisco and one went to San Diego, but everybody else is in Idaho. Yeah. So, um, And in high school, would they have kind of predicted that you would have been the guy that went to Dartmouth and Harvard and CEO of a tech company? I don't know. You'd have to ask them that, but they're good at keeping me honest and humble and just, I love those guys. They're, they're I'm great sure. guys. So I'm sure. there's that aspect of Idaho. My family's there, my brother, my niece, um, his family, uh, my parents. Um, it's mm -hmm. just a wonderful place. Are you the oldest or the youngest? Youngest. So your brother's how much older? Six years older. Oh, six years older. Yeah. That's awesome. They totally. must be super proud of you. And so growing up, did your mom work? And what did your, your dad was in the family business? Mm -hmm. My grandfather started a business called Oppenheimer Companies that my uncle and dad now run. And it's um, a mix of both broadly um, real estate on one side and then um, food distribution, food processing. So, What kind of food? Uh, it's everything from a food distribution program, so um, uh, making sure that uh, suppliers of like small stores all over the country can buy their supplies in an efficient mm -hmm. way, a company called Goldbond. Um, <clears throat> part of it's like food processing, so like private label whip topping. There's one branded product called True Whip that's like a natural alternative mm -hmm. to like Cool Whip. So it's kind of diversified in a lot of different areas. And so your grandfather started it. So did you think that that was kind of your trajectory? 
Yeah, my um, certainly left a very, very strong imprint on me in terms of just entrepreneurship. But um, my parents, my dad and my uncle created a rule that anybody who wanted to go into the family business in the next generation had to go work somewhere else for five years. And then all of almost all my cousin just went into the business, which is awesome. But a lot of other like including myself, I developed a lot of my own passions, you know, Mm -hmm. gone on and do different things. But I still, you know love the family business. I love what they do. I think it's amazing yeah. what they've built. Is it private? Is privately held company? Yep. Yeah. That's great. What were you into in high school? Were you like music, sports, mountains? It's funny. I had an interesting high school experience. I was into, I guess, people and relationships broadly and, and trying to make an impact, which has been a theme, I think, um, throughout my life. So I started a nonprofit. Um, I saw that people under the age of 18 didn't have a voice in the political process. And so I started this nonpartisan group called the youth lobbying organization, where we thought we'd take stances on issues, um, but Idaho is very diverse politically. Boise is more liberal. Um, I think of it as being really conservative. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's certainly more conservative than Seattle, but so is most of the country. Boise tends to be a little more liberal, and then rural Idaho tends to be more conservative. And so I started this organization where we brought together one student from every high school in the in the state. And again, we, we created the bylaws. You had to have two-thirds majority to take a stance on an issue. So we, took, we never took a stance on an issue, but we did do is we had this annual lobbying day where we brought together, you know, a lot of amazing people to help educate people under the age of 18 on issues that impacted them. And then we um, had uh, everybody, you know, have an opportunity to meet with our legislators. Um, that's even though, incredible. Yeah, so that's stuff like that. There was Who I, influenced you to get into that? Are your parents kind of politically involved? Uh, they're socially and civically involved, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it, there was an issue that I cared about, and... Um, I thought it was strange that people under the age of 18 didn't have a voice in that issue. What and was so the issue? It was, it was actually a much more controversial issue. It was parental consent for abortion. I thought at the very least people under the age of 18 should have a, like a voice in that process, given that it impacted people under the age of 18. I tend to be more liberal, so mm-hmm. I tended to think that parental consent was not a good idea, not required. And I testified back in the day um, on that specific issue. But the organization did not take a stance on the issue because when you bring together folks from all over the state, yeah. like – a lot of folks do think, even if you're under the age of 18, um, that folks should have to have parental consent. And I tried to not be super politicized because my goal of the organization was not to change people's views or minds. My goal of the youth lobbying organization was to make sure that people under the age of 18 had you know, a voice. And there were mm-hmm. other issues that came up like – pay around migrant farm workers it was an issue that we talked a lot about. But we had, like, former governors speak. We had legislators. That's and this... incredible, Matt. That's awesome. And it, where is that organization now? It did not continue because— Can you restart it? <clears throat> yeah. Well, I uh, went to college, and I could tell you a couple of the funny stories, but I did a lot of things outside of school. And mm-hmm. so I missed one semester. I can't believe I got through high school. One semester I missed 45 out of 90 days Um I think There's that's like right. 50% about, of the time of, yeah, I don't know out. if the, those numbers are exactly right, but about 50% of the time I was out. And I was doing all these civic things like that. Um, I also... But that's leadership stuff that's like so hard to find. It's easy to find the kid that can sit and kind of study and learn the test versus somebody who's putting themselves out there. Yeah, I don't know. I just loved it. And I loved people. The other thing I did, which was a lot of fun, was I realized that there was no safe space for people to go to party and have fun. And so I can't believe my parents let me do this. But <laughs> it was back we in the threw day. these like large, very large drug and alcohol free parties. And they were, I mean, the big one after graduation was called like Summerfest. And there were like 500 plus people at our house. Um, we'd hire security. My brother, who's six years older, as I mentioned, would help um, to make sure there weren't no drugs and alcohol. Um, there were fights. There were different things that happened that we had to manage. But it, the idea was that, like, I mean, there was just a lot of fun. We had, like, live music. We had, like, mud volleyball. We had mud wrestling. We had, like, piting contests. We had a That's dunk so tank. Cool. It was so fun. Well, in so, Idaho, I guess you can have a lot of property, so you can have 500 people in your house. <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun. So I did stuff like that. Your high school was public? It was public, yep. Like a Boise big high school, high school? That my parents went to, my uncle went to, my, oh my grandma gosh. went to, my brother That's went so to. That's so cool. Boise High School, yeah. That's great. You yeah. have to go back and give the commencement speech. <laughs> I don't think I'm that big of a deal, but you are a I big loved, deal. I loved it. There. You're a BFD. <laughs> you are. And so, how did you choose Dartmouth? Because all of my friends who went to Dartmouth, yeah. it's like a thing. People are like obsessed. Yeah. With Dartmouth. Yeah. How did I end up at Dartmouth? It was less scientific. I uh, applied to ten schools. Um, didn't get into a lot of them. Got into Dartmouth. Um, I love the outdoors, and. 
I thought it'd be a really hard experience, which it was. It was a big transition freshman year, mm-hmm. given that I didn't go to a lot of high school. Um, <laughs> yeah, given that you weren't at school. It was so hard. Uh, but I knew it would be good for me. I knew it would stretch me, and I loved being on the outdoors, and I wanted the experience of being on the East Coast for a while. I know you studied psychology. Yeah. And so how did you – did you have business classes? Did you take business classes? Yeah. I mean, Dartmouth's typical liberal arts education, so the closest would have been economics. And I took some economics classes, but um, I always was drawn to psychology just because – I lo- I'm fascinated by people, and to your extrovert question, I'm very, very extroverted, and so it's so key, it turns out, in being a CEO, is yes. understanding, reading people, recruiting people, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you're also one of the most generous CEOs that I've met. I have not met one person that's not like, oh, yeah, Matt, I mean, you say yes, and I don't know how you're continuing to do that, especially now that you have a baby. <laughs> you're going to have to start, I got, I got you early, don't have any more kids. You're going to have to say no to things. And so um, so you went to Dartmouth, and then when you graduated, I know you went to HBS, but you went, did you do investment banking between? I did investment consulting. Investment which, consulting. Yeah, which was mostly like, you know, Dartmouth, has, Dartmouth, which was one of my clients, has um, a large endowment. Um, you know, endowments, foundations need to figure out how to do their, and a lot of them, you know, do it very independently. So it depended on how large the institution was in terms of the services we provided. But it's asset allocation for how they're investing that. It's it's investment manager selection. It's spending policy, things like that. And it was really amazing, amazing clients. Like the impact that some of them had on disadvantaged children. There were some in the arts. There were educational institutions. Just an amazing, amazing place. Was it kind of a necessity for you in your mind to go get an MBA? I always thought I'd get an MBA, um, and I even like started studying for the GMATs and all that in college um, because I knew I'd be in business of some and sort. And were you thinking, I'm going to get an MBA so that I'm contributing to the family business, or were you thinking, I already know that I might want to pursue my own thing? Uh, I didn't know it. I didn't know at that point. I just knew it'd be something broadly. And, and an MBA also includes like being able to run a nonprofit more effectively. It's, it's yeah. kind of jo- broader like business and management, and I knew that that was going to be the, the route that I headed in. And I was very lucky enough. By the way, I was super, super lucky to get into Dartmouth. And I was super lucky to get into Harvard. And so... I don't know about lucky. Lucky people call themselves lucky. uh, There's... There was a lot of luck, a lot of privilege, a lot of other things that played into it. And I think that what I've always told myself throughout my life is like, can I use that fortune and that privilege to hopefully make a a bit of a positive impact in the world? Yeah. Did you have any hardship, like the kind of dips in your lifeline early on? Yeah, I mean, there there have been challenges, but nothing like a lot of folks face, right? I mean, mm-hmm. and that's the great thing about growing up in Boise is you learn how much, like, privilege has an impact. Like, I was starting the youth lobbying organization while, you know, some of my buddies had to work because they needed to pay for their own food in high school. Like, and Boise was not a ethnically diverse place, but it was socioeconomically diverse. Mm-hmm. And that also has had a pretty strong, you know, impact on me. Because when I say privilege, it's things like that. It's amazing. It was so cool. I started the youth lobbying organization. Don't get me wrong, but, like... It was a privilege to be able to do that. Of course, because you had the opportunity to have the time to be able to do it. Exactly. It's Mm -hmm. like a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so HBS you loved. Mm -hmm. And friends of mine who went there have all said that it's extra good at um, kind of teaching organization and project management. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's Mm -hmm. true? Yeah, I think it's good at those things. I think the case method uh, is also really helpful because half your grade is based on class participation. And I think that's a really good training for business. In business, you don't get exams in the middle of the day. You have to insert the right views and move conversations forward. That doesn't mean talking all the time. Like that's not at HBS. Like you did not get good grades if you did that. So I think that I liked that aspect of it. I liked the fact that it's just such an amazing group of people. Mm-hmm. Um, Are you and, still in touch? I know you've got your seven besties from high school. What about Dartmouth and mm-hmm. HBS? Yeah, I'm very yeah. fortunate. I have like a very solid group of, of Dartmouth buddies. Um, and then at Harvard, yeah, there's a group of us that get together um, once a year. We have a reunion this year. So we were just exchanging emails about all sharing a house there, which will be fun. Oh, that'll be super yeah. fun. Are many of your HBS classmates in tech or did they go kind of the consulting banking mm-hmm. route? It's a, it's a range. Some are in... Um, tech, like one of my best buddies who ended up living on the same street as me in Seattle, Washington, randomly. Oh, that is weird. Um, yeah. Uh, we've since moved, but like we are both in Seattle. He he works for a pitch book. Um, okay. One of our best friends works for the uh, housing, I think it's the Housing Development Authority. Um, 
it, in New York, like the post Sandy, like uh, Hurricane Sandy relief effort she helped okay. lead. And now she's got even a bigger role there. So it's a real range of, yeah. of different jobs. I think it's great that you've got friends that are doing all sorts of different things. Yeah. And then tell me how you ended up uh, working at Barclays and Kenya and London. Yeah. I mean, how cool. Did you raise your hand and say, pick me? Or did that kind of happen organically? Yeah. So when I was looking at jobs post Harvard, I wanted to do a general management program. So a lot of folks like assume that Barclays was an investment banking role, but there's corporate banking, like providing banking services to your average business, right? Small business. And then there's retail banking, which is having like a Barclays or, you know, Bank of America um, in the U.S. context bank account. I was in their corporate and retail banking. Mm. And when I was looking at jobs, I looked at a variety of general management roles, but it, what I was drawn to at Barclays was the fact that it was international, which has also been a kind of theme throughout my life. Mm -hmm. And um, I got really good advice from the now dean. He was one of my professors, but now dean of um, HBS. Called, his name's Nitin Noria. And he was basically like, okay, go, you, go do Barclays. Like, but London is like international. I, I like done real some, international. Yeah, I had done some volunteer work in Africa. And so I just his, this conversation stuck with me because after I had been in London for a bit, I took the definite road less traveled within the Barclays. Like, you don't if you're trying to work your way up in the Barclays, like, you know, mothership, you don't go to Nairobi, Kenya and run digital channels for them. It's just far afield. But Nitin's um, advice stuck with me and I went there and had a great experience in Kenya and then that's obviously where the idea for Remitly came from. Yeah, and so tell me about that. Like, Do you remember the moment when you thought of the idea and who did you first kind of run it past? Uh, the idea was more organic in the sense that like, and it's actually much broader than Kenya. Um, I've, the other thing is as a kid growing up in Boise, my, it was really important to my parents that we traveled internationally. And so I've been to close to 100 countries, and we went to places as a young, young kid when I was like six or seven years old to a lot of developing countries. And I saw as a six-year-old like how much inequality and, and how much poverty there was in a lot of developing countries. Thankfully, that trend is like dr it's dramatically improving in terms of poverty. Um, but it struck me as a young kid. And now fast forward to Kenya, and I saw that remittances were an enormously – huge, impactful, and sustainable part of pulling people out of poverty, giving people opportunities. And I saw that in Kenya, there was also a product called M-Pesa, which is like a domestic mobile wallet. It was It's transformed financial services in Kenya. And I was like, well, why couldn't we use mobile phones to actually you know, transform the international payments landscape, the Western unions and money grams of the world, which is not, at the end of the day, a rocket science idea, but the timing for that was uh, was right. And, and even over the last, since I started the business in 2011, smartphone adoption globally has continued to grow, and people are just trusting smartphones for financial services. And as mm -hmm. that's happening- Oh, I do, my, I do like big, huge transactions on my phone. And yeah. Sometimes yep. scary, but I'm like, well, I guess this is what we're doing these days. Exactly, exactly. And so it's uh, it's it was the right time to start the business, and and thankfully, um, I think we've we've helped a lot of people. So, walk me through starting the business. Yeah, you're in Idaho because you went back to Idaho. Yeah, and why did you go back to Idaho? So the second part of your question of like, was there who gave me a nudge or you know what was that moment? I do remember vividly sitting on the um, deck of our place in Kenya and. I was talking to a guy who's been a mentor of mine since I was – I interned with him in college, a guy named mm -hmm. Mark Solon who's now at Techstars Ventures. And he was then the general partner at a venture capital firm in Boise called Highway 12 Ventures. And I called him and I said, hey, here, here's the idea. And he just was like so just encouraging and was like, do it. You got it. Like go for it. And so I moved back to Boise to be entrepreneur in residence at Highway 12 Ventures. And, and I actually – in a lot of ways, would have loved to build the business in Boise, but I knew like very early on, you got like a month or two. Yeah, it's just too high. As a first-time entrepreneur, the talent, there's a lot of amazing, amazing people in Boise, but the scale and size of the business we were building, it would have been a pretty pretty big barrier. So yeah. that's when we did Techstars in Seattle and moved to Seattle. And did you have, um, like all entrepreneurs have that kind of vision and ambition, but also some element of some self-doubt around kind of where your blind spots might be? Um, did you feel well prepared? Hmm. Well, the first part in terms of self doubt, absolutely. I think that anybody who doesn't, who says they have no self doubt, I'm skeptical of that. I at least can tell you I have self doubt all the time, and that it's not just at the beginning of the business; that goes through every day of every year. And 
I like that I'm being stretched, but with being stretched definitely comes like self-doubt. And actually, while we're on that topic, I try to be pretty, I mean, my job seven years later with close to 800 people worldwide. And how many offices? Four? Four, yep. Yep. Uh, London, Seattle, uh, Nicaragua. Nicaragua and the Philippines. Yeah. But every year what I do, since my job is so different, is I do a th- an organized 360 and I put together a development plan and I share that development plan with, you know, a broad set of folks. I went through it verbally with the entire company. So I think it's important to lead by example that like it, it, maybe it's the other side of self-doubt, but more importantly, like we're all growing and developing. And that's a big part of why at least I'm doing a startup is my own it, it's personal growth and development. Reason number one is making a positive impact in people's lives. Reason number two, and I'm very intentional about it, is my own growth and development. And so does everyone else do the same thing, the, the 360s also? We do have an organized like annual performance review process mm-hmm. that includes a 360 component. Mm-hmm. Um, but we want to continue to invest even more and more because there's there's the 360 and then there's development plans. We want to continue as a company to invest in that, but ultimately it also has to be employee-led. Like you can't – the best systems and process can't, you know, make someone develop. It has to be employee-led and there has to be that desire to to grow and develop. Yeah. Well, that probably also helps dictate your culture. Mm-hmm. So you came, you did Techstars. Yep. And found co-founders? Yep. We had one co-founder going in. Okay. Um, which uh, – is a, a wonderful guy. All three co-founders are still with the business seven years in. Shavas Gulati's, uh joined as a co-founding engineer. And then there's my co-founder and COO, Josh Hug. So That's all three. Awesome. And we met Josh in Techstars, but Shavas and I came into Techstars as two co-founders. And how did you know that you guys would kind of groove? Did you do any sort of vetting of like personality assessments or kind of like how do we pick our lane and make sure that we're kind of mm-hmm. complementing one another? Yeah. I knew I needed someone strong technically. You know, it's really important to know what you don't know. And I've talked to a lot of folks, both technologists and business folks, who I think by definition, because they don't know, don't appreciate how hard the other job is. Right. And so I went into it saying I want the you know best technologists and product folks because I know virtually nothing about that. At the time, I knew less than nothing, if that's possible. And Shavas was in Pittsburgh winding down his previous startup, moved out to uh, – or came out to Boise. We, we didn't do any personality assessments or anything like that, but every person I met, I um, spent a lot of time with. So he came mm-hmm. out to Boise. We spent a bunch of time together. And what was your vetting process mentally? Yeah. Like how did you make sure that you were aligned? Yeah. Well, now there's a lot more structure to it, and I can talk about how we vet now. Back then, it was more um, – it, it was always focused on culture, right? I probably couldn't have articulated, like, I want someone who has a bias for action and who sweats the details and is data-driven and is customer-centric. But those were ultimately the things that I was looking for. Right. And what about just are we on the same page with the direction of the company and what we want to build and that mm-hmm. we want to kind of go big? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was always that was always a prerequisite. Um, so that was important. And then I, I had other folks – chat with Shavas at the time around the technical aptitude, but it was a co-founder component too. So it didn't, mm-hmm. wasn't an interview. It was more of a conversation. Right. For yeah. sure. And so have the roles changed and how are you spending your time these days versus those early days? Yeah, the roles definitely changed. It's, um, you know, the beginning is all, almost all direct kind of individual contribution work and in a highly regulated, highly complex business like remittances, I loved that I could have, my job I felt like as CEO was to get all the things like out of the way in a positive way. Like we went, we did all the things the right way from a regulatory perspective and all that from day one, getting licenses in every state. Like there were so many things like that that I felt like if I can empower the product team to build a phenomenal product, just that's what I was doing. And I was, I was deep in that. Mm -hmm. Now it's all, you know, we've, we've been lucky enough to bring in like the best of the best in every respective function. And so it's management, it's, it's leadership, it's setting the right culture, mm-hmm. it's recruiting, it's all those things, which it's is everything. very different um, than the early days, but I also love. Do you have, I know that you, if you weren't doing this, you, could, you would be such a killer recruiter because you really are just a connector and you do have a genuine interest in people. Um, do you have any go-to strategies around interviewing or good questions that our listeners could steal? I mean, the biggest one, which is hard to really make super actionable tomorrow, but I do think it's the most effective, is like truly getting to know people over a longer time period, and especially with the kind of senior executives we're recruiting now. Um, that's important. And like we just hired the former CMO of Ancestry as our CMO, and I've known Rob for two years. Um, 
And I wasn't trying to recruit him. I was just getting his advice, you know, when I met him and always kind of caught up with him when I was had time in the Bay Area. And so that's a big one is like playing the long game. Mm-hmm. Um, and so and, he's here now in Seattle? Yeah, he's relocating his family up to Seattle. Yeah, which he's... That's a hard one too. Good close. Yeah, he's he's excited and we're so excited. So that's been a lot of the hires we've made have been like that. Um because it's just hard. I mean, I can tell you our interview process and questions I ask, we can go there. But I really do think it's hard in one conversation to get to know somebody well enough yeah. um, to make a very important decision around executive hires that yeah. we make now. Well, maybe just a couple nuggets around your process and a couple interview questions. And then I really want to understand also the fundraising because raising over $200 mm-hmm. million is, is like that's that's not nothing. <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. So um, you are a big deal. I don't think so. But I surround myself with people who are big deals and are very good. That's my secret. <laughs> um, interview process. I think what's important at a philosophical level is screening on values. So we have, first of all, when we talked about culture, we have 14 cultural values. Sounds like a lot. 14? Yep. That's the most I've ever heard. Yeah, but if you look at a lot of companies, like take um, the like Amazon, GE. Let's take Amazon as an example because we're in Seattle. And I don't want to compare us to Amazon in terms of the content of our culture, but in the construct for how they embed culture. They have mm-hmm. leadership principles. They have something like 14, 15, something like that. It's over 10. Mm-hmm. And I think that it, they're not – people confuse culture with like, hey, you got to memorize those. And that's not what it's about. It's about having a north star of behaviors, of how people interact, how people get things done that is unique to a company. And every company has them. Some companies just choose to define them mm-hmm. and be more intentional about them. And so we have 14. And I, to be fair, like we refresh them every year. And I think that there well, is... that's a good idea. Yeah, because then people actually engage and understand them, too. Because mm-hmm. if you do have just 14, you don't engage on and them. And what's the process? You're not engaging all 800 people on this conversation, or are yeah, you? Yeah, we got to figure it out this year, to be honest, because we've grown a lot. Yeah. Um, but we engaged everybody the last time we did a refresh. We were a lot smaller. I just have to, like, take that in for a minute. 800? Because I think when yeah. I met you, there was, like, five people. We were sitting in a room, like, yeah. the size of the studio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it's an amazing team. Do you have fear around having that many employees? You know, because um, sometimes for me, I like to know, like, we're people people. And yeah. so you want to know who they are. You want to be, have them feel like they have access to you. 800, yeah. that's hard to do. It is. It is. Um, the uh, We've tried doing some things that uh, still don't, that people say will never scale. But like once a month, so last night, um, my wife and I had, we always cap it at about 10 people. But we had about five-ish, five, six remotely employees, um, their partners and their kids. And we had a wonderful dinner for like two or three hours, and I got to know them and I got to know their family. So I can't do that with everybody now because we're hiring faster than, you know, 10 per month. We intentionally keep it small because uh, then we actually truly, like we're all around one table and we get to know each other. And so More intimate. Yeah, and so, you know, I don't know everybody as deep as I used to, but I try to still get to know folks across all levels in a genuine mm-hmm. way because even if I don't know everybody on the product team or the marketing team mm-hmm. or you name it, like I've had, you know, several of them over to my house for dinner. That's which great. Which is cool. So anyway. And that's nice of Emily too. Is she an ex- an extrovert or an introvert? She is an extrovert, yeah. And it is very nice of her. She is so, so supportive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is like a, a 50-50 situation here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what would those employees, just ask some random employee who might be kind of slightly removed from you, what words would they use to describe you, do you think? Oh, I don't I don't know. Um, what words do you hope they use to describe you? What words do I hope they would use to describe me? I would say compassionate comes to mind, direct, inspirational. Those would be some of the words. And what about how, how are those words different than how Emily would describe you? I think they're probably pretty pretty similar. Yeah. yeah. So you're like Matt at work is the same as Matt anywhere. Yeah, I think so. So do you have rituals? Do you follow any kind of I get up in the morning, I meditate, I read? I do get up on my best days and meditate. Um, so I, I knew do you were going to be that guy. It's yeah. Like, uh, it's who I want to be when I, I grow up. Yeah. It's a little cliche now, but I have No, it's I, not. It's important. There's a reason why it's cliche. Yeah. But I, I have done it for a long time and it does bring me kind of balance. I exercise a lot. So this morning I got up and went to hot yoga. Um, I do that a couple times a week. Um, I jog into work. Um, and every, then shower at work? Yep. And I jog to yoga too. So I try Jeez. to I try to find time, right? Like, Do like, you eat right too? Uh, no, I don't think so. Running is like found time for me. I like it. And so 
Um, I know I've met your wife, Emily, Mm -hmm. a few times. Mm -hmm. She's lovely and lucky to be married to you, and I'm sure you feel the same way. How Mm -hmm. did you meet? Uh, We met at the uh, Fremont Abbey Arts Center um, in Fremont, which is where we lived for a long time. And then we found each other on Facebook, and the rest is history. That's so cool. Yeah. And so when and you got married a few years ago. Yep. Now you're a dad. Yep. And how has that changed you? Is it different than what you thought? It's been wonderful. And she's and Alice, our daughter, is getting to the age where she's just like smiling, interacting more, and she's just seeing everything in the world with a sense of wonder. And so it's been really fun to see the world through her eyes. Oh yeah, it's the best. So just like present in the moment. And she's just a cool kid like yesterday we had some flight issues coming back from idaho the day before and the flight was canceled we go to bed at like midnight we get up at 3 30 a.m pacific 4 30 a.m mountain get delayed on the tarmac again fly back and land she's just rolling she's just rolling with it i'm sure you got so many comments on the plane oh my god because so... everybody looks and they're like oh no i'm sitting yeah. next to the baby and you're like just kidding she's... you're not yeah she's super human. and then this dinner we hosted last night too i think she's an extrovert because this dinner we hosted last night too she was like hey everybody how's it going she's like yeah. looking around um and so i'm, I'm going all over the place because i feel like as i told you this podcast <laughs> is kind of all of you so not just you the ceo of remitly you the dad you the friend um, you, the activist, I love all the things that you're so passionate about. You're clearly like awake and paying attention to the world. And um, do you have someone that, that you would say kind of really inspired you? I've read that it's your grandma is a real inspiration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of the folks that first come to mind in terms of who have inspired me are my grandma. My dad wrote a book about my grandma called it, and the title is well, something my grandma used to always say was, which was, it will all work out. And so certainly my grandmother on my um, dad's side is who we're talking about right now. Jane Oppenheimer, she was definitely an inspiration to me. My grandmother on my mom's side was also like huge. Like she was born in Nebraska, I believe. And during the Dust Bowl with like 12 siblings, um, got in the back of a van and drove west looking for work with her family. They picked cotton in California. They, like, um, tried to make ends meet and eventually landed in Boise where she met my grandfather and they were married for 50-plus years. She always had such a just... Both my grand, grandmothers, like, optimistic, can-do attitude. Like, I mean, my grandmother and my dad's side had, like, polio um, and was put in a full body cast. Like, the trials that they went through, I feel like I just have so much respect and admiration for. So they come to mind, actually, just as humans. Uh, my dad comes to mind, my uncle... My aunt on my on my dad's side, um, Deanna Oppenheimer, she is an amazing mentor. Wait, did I just hear her speak? Is she here in Seattle? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Okay, that's your aunt. Yeah. She's fantastic. She is I, I did the um like board list. Yep. Board ready. Board, board list. ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She was one of the speakers. Yeah, and so she is huge. She's she's been a. We've been close since I was. She was fun. Little. Yeah, and she's so she's just. I I talk to her all the time That's about great. management and leadership issues because she's managed hundreds of thousands of people, so she comes to mind. Um, so there's so many people, and a yeah. lot of them like a lot of a lot of females. Lot I'm of, sure your mom and yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Totally, my mom. Like it's a lot of family actually. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. That's your foundation right there. Yeah, that's that is a privilege to have not just the privilege of any sort of socioeconomic privilege, mm-hmm. but just the positive energy around you. Totally. Exactly. So you, yeah. it, it can help you be fearless as a leader. Yeah. That's great. Totally. And what about other CEOs? Any that you would love to have coffee with? Uh, it's a good question. I do think that um, Warren Buffett, interestingly, I've always felt like he is a very thoughtful, very humble, um, very grounded. And I know he's obviously more of an investor than a CEO, but like He's been someone who I've always admired. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you just had a free day to yourself, you're an extrovert, so I'd probably be with other people. But what would you want to be doing? Yeah. I'd probably go and do a long run. I'd get up in the morning, have my cup of tea, um, do my kind of meditation morning routine, go on a long run, maybe also do some yoga. Like, I feel so much better a if I do those best. things. And then I, I'm also an early bird. Like, I get up super early, so I'd probably come home and... Alice and Emily would be getting up because <laughs> I've been up since like four. And you then, literally get up at four? No, not four, but I get up early. Yeah, I'd hang out with them, um, go adventuring and, and do something with them. If I woke up a little bit later, I'd go on a run with Alice, which is yeah. super fun. And so what do you um, hope for 
Alice? Like, what what kind of world are you hoping you can help inspire? I mean, first for her, and then I'll talk about the world she lives in, I hope that she lives a life of happiness and that's full of adventure. And I think that there's a lot of things I hope for her, but that, that's what comes to mind. In terms of the world she lives in, and I think the, the role I hope she'll play as part of it is um, – Having compassion, I feel like, is like one of the most important things, especially in today's world that there's so much divisiveness, so much there's them and there's us. And I think that um, part of how I was raised and grew up and meeting a lot of different type of people, it's, it's one of my favorite things about life. I hope that she also has a desire to truly get to know people that are different than her because we've got to unwind the us and them mentality in so many different ways. Like you can pick whatever example of that in today's world comes to mind and start like – talking. Um, Because fundamentally, I think people are good. And fundamentally, I think people want to solve problems and people want to solve similar problems. Sometimes there'll be disagreements. And I hope that Alice can join that conversation as opposed to the us and them mentality that that, that that concerns me. Amen. It's a Mm -hmm. huge concern. I completely agree. And so um, the question that I always ask people on this because of the name of the podcast and the reason why I started it is what fuels you? Mm -hmm. I think what fuels me is I mean, purpose comes to mind, but also just relationships comes to mind. Like I am very, like at the end of the day, at the end of life, I really believe that at the end of the day, we have relationships. And those, I think, are most important and most poignant in in a family. But they also extend far beyond that. My dad's actually always said that. It's like at the end of the day, life is all about relationships. It's not about money. It's not about... I could not agree more. And so, like, I think what fuels me is relationships. Like last night, like I said, I didn't get much sleep the night before. We had this dinner with, you know... Um, a group of Remitlians at our house. And like, I was loving it because I was like getting to know them at a personal level. That's what fuels me. Yeah. yeah. So this podcast probably resonates for you because that's what this is. I mean, it's a hundred percent what drove me to even do this yeah. is that I'm wired the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like it's fun for others to get to know you who would want to otherwise grab coffee with you. Mm-hmm. So hopefully this has um, enlightened our listeners to be able to know Matt Oppenheimer a little bit better. I know it's been fun for me. No, this has been fun. Thanks for doing this. Super I think fun. it's really, really cool you're yeah, doing this. Thank you for participating. I might ask you to come back because I'm sure we're going to have fun watching you this year and in years to come. Thanks, Thanks. Jonna. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest news and episodes. You can also contact us at podcast at fueltalent.com to provide feedback, ask questions, and share topics or guests you would like us to cover in the future. We hope you feel inspired by our guests and that we have helped fuel your day. Join us next time for another episode of What Fuels You.